Linux installation. So what is Linux? Well, Linux is the kernel that powers the Linux operating system. Okay, that's kind of nice. And kernels are programs that talk directly to the hardware and manage resources and processes. So what does that mean? Well, in a CPU, your chip that runs your computer, ever since the 386 processors, we've had this separation. You have the kernel process, and then you have everything else is in user land, and they're separate. So the way to make security work was they decided to separate them and decided that only one program was allowed to talk to the hard drive, talk to the RAM, talk to all the other physical devices, and that program was then responsible for making sure other programs started up and gave them permission to access things. So the Linux kernel does that in the Linux operating system. It's the only program allowed to talk to the hardware directly. Everything else has to talk to the Linux kernel through things called system calls. Kernels need a whole operating system to be useful. There are different kinds of operating systems. If you look at Linux, you'll see that there are the GNU Linux operating systems, which is basically the GNU software mixed with the Linux kernel. You also find things like Android. Android is the Linux kernel put on top of, well, added to a bunch of other software to run a phone. When a Linux kernel is bundled with operating system software and shipped together, that is called a Linux distribution. In the Linux family or Linux world, there are many different families of distributions. You have the Red Hat family, you have the Debian family, you have all these source code distributions. And then there's this whole recent debate about changing in it to system D. Most distributions have switched to system D, but some are still back on the old init system. So what's the Red Hat family? Well, the Red Hat family is one of the earliest families of Linux distributions. They discovered, the Red Hat people discovered there was a problem. And that problem was, how do you package and ship software? And not just ship it, but ship it in such a way that you know which version of software you have and you can install things and make sure that they work together. And so the Red Hat company created this Red Hat package management software. And what happens here is all of your packages come as these RPM files. And these RPM files are then installed and there is a database that keeps track of which ones are installed and then each RPM can tell you what its dependencies are. It's become more advanced now. You have uh, big repositories that keep track of lots of different things and keep track of what the dependencies are so you don't have to try to figure that out on your own. The Debian family is basically the same thing as the, R, as the Red Hat family, it's just slightly different and that would be with the dev packages instead of the RPM packages. Um, slightly different focus. Red Hat tends to focus more on corporate um, company type things and Debian's more the end user experience. Then you have these source code distributions. Well, these source code distributions, which includes things like, uh, I guess, Slackware and Gentoo and Arch, these things, they try to ship something but it wants to build stuff from source code because if you build from source code you have a much higher chance of things being compatible or not compatible and knowing very quickly you also have situations where you want to optimize your system and red hat and debian well they they're written with generic systems in mind and they're not really optimized for anything so it's kind of hard to optimize a red hat or debian system much but source code can get you much more optimized of course it can be much worse as well and then there is this whole system so once the kernel starts up the next big thing is how do you start up everything else well you have this very first process after the kernel that runs and in it the system 5 in it 
was something that came out of the old Unix world, and it runs these systems. It starts up your services, and it eventually brings you to your GUI or your command line and starts something up for you. System D was created because they realized there were a couple of issues with init. First of all, it did everything sequential, and you want to be able to do some things in a different order. Maybe you want to be able to start two things at the same time if they don't have any dependency relationship. Uh, and then they just change the whole way of doing things so it's more you know, closer together. Init is a just very organized scripts that do things, and systemd is a more organized system of doing stuff. So some hardware considerations. When you are getting ready to install Linux, you need to know, can your machine boot the installation media? So that could be a CD-ROM hard drive. It could be a floppy, or it could be some kind of network-based thing. You have to decide, can you boot it? Because you have to be able to boot into something in order to do your installation. And you also need to know how much hard drive space do you need? Normally, the earlier versions of Linux could get by with just a couple of, well, megs. Then it moved up to a couple of gigs. And now you're looking at right around eight or so gigs, and it's going to probably grow and get bigger as you need more and more in order to run. How much RAM do you need? Well, in the early days, you only needed a couple of megabytes, but now, if you want a GUI, you have to have at least a gigabyte of RAM. And that's just kind of a minimum. You really want more than that. You want to know, will your video card work? One of the issues that originally plagued Linux was... These video cards would come out, but they had this whole thing about secret drivers. If you make a mistake with the hardware, all you have to do is just fix it in the driver and no one will know. But now, well, people do find out because most of the video cards have source code that is available to look at and people can see, oh, you messed up. The same kind of thing happens with the wireless cards because if you have wireless cards, you want to have drivers. Linux likes to run with everything compiled from source code rather than just binary drivers. You also need to look at your other hardware needs. Do you need to have scanners or cameras or other devices hooked up? And do you have software for it? So you can look and try to figure out if the software is available and working for Linux. There are a couple of different installation methods. You can do a DVD installation. So this is typical for physical devices when you want to physically install it on a computer. Also, if you're using something like VirtualBox or VMware, you might use an ISO installation. You're actually doing a DVD installation, but the ISO image is really the image of the DVD before it's burned onto a DVD. And the virtualization software can pretend that the DVD is actually burned and install off of that image. You can do USB installations. You can do hard drive installations if it's already installed in the hard drive and you can install from there. And sometimes you can do network installations, but that requires having some kind of a boot service and being able to install, well, off the network. Time and date. When you're doing your installation, you need to have your time and date set. So how does a computer clock work? Well, you've probably seen movies about crystals and stuff like that and trekking through jungles trying to find amazing crystals that'll make things work great. Really the whole idea is you're just trying to find a clock, trying to make a clock work. And so they use quartz crystals. The idea is if you send electricity through quartz crystal, it oscillates at a given frequency and the computer can count that and keep track of date and time. The problem is that not all quartz crystals are created equal so it doesn't work that way. I mean they get off a little bit. So in order to make things work properly you have to use things like network time. So let's talk about time zones. Well if everybody were in the same time zone it wouldn't matter what time zone we were in.
But if we were in different time zones, then there are all these differences. The question of, is it always the same number of minutes different between two different time, do time zones? Well, that's not quite right, because you have things like daylight savings time and other things that mess everything up. Sometimes political changes change your time zones. And you want to make sure that you have the same time as somebody else. If you are in Seattle and someone else is in New York, well, there are a couple of time zones between you. And you want to make sure you have the same time, not the same time of the day, but knowing that you can take the time on your computer and calculate out what time it is in a different computer somewhere else. So it is important to make sure you set the correct time zone so that you know that you are not the same time as someone else. When you are storing your time on your computer, it gets written out into a chip. And the question is, do you want to store local time or UTC? UTC would be your Greenwich Mean Time or your Zulu Time. So Windows machines tend to use local time for everything. Well, that's great until you move your computer from one time zone to another time zone because then you have to sit there and recalculate everything. Linux likes to store everything as UTC. So then all it needs to know is what time zone I am, am I in. And then when it reads it from the computer, it can immediately translate it into your time zone and be fine. Windows, when you move from one time zone to another time zone, you have to change it from your local time to UTC then to the other time zone. Much more complex. Network time communicates over the network. You send a request to a server. The server sends you the time as UTC, and you have to calculate it and convert it to local time. When you're doing your installation, you have to do your software selections. You have to decide which software should I select. Normally, the default is to have a minimal install. A minimal install has really minimal software. There's very little there. If you want to have a secure server, you want to start with a minimal install. However, if you want a desktop, you don't want to start with a minimal install. You want to start with something like the GNOME desktop option. So make sure you have the right one selected. What type of machine do you have? Well, that's back to your hardware questions. What hardware do you have? And you also need to decide how is this machine going to be used? Are you using it as a desktop machine or as a server? Are you running it as a web server? So you want to try to pick what you want. If you are running it as a server and you don't want to be hacked, it's best to start with a minimal install. If you want to run it as a desktop, well, just start with a desktop. Can you install packages later? Yes, you can. You can install lots of packages later. Everything that you can do during installation, you can pretty much do later. And where does the software come from? Well, you have these software repositories and your software comes from the repositories and you download it and install it. And Linux, when you have these Linux distributions, these distributions are, the main purpose of them is to provide these repositories so you can get your software later. What are the requirements of different packages? Well, fortunately you don't have to know too much, but the repository does keep track of which software is required by which other software pieces. So when you do an installation of a particular piece of software, it will search through a database and figure out which dependencies are required and check your system to see which ones you already have. And then after it's decided which ones you have, it can download everything you're missing, install those, and then the package you need. So you don't need to worry too much. When you are doing your installation, you need to install Linux onto the hard drive. So, where is that? Well, you have a hard drive, and you have it divided into individual partitions. So the hard drive can be different drive volumes. And Linux can be installed in any one of these volumes. Normally, you'd want to install at least the bootloader, the main parts of it, uh, on the beginning part of the hard drive so that you can then read later parts of the hard drive and see everything. You also have this thing 
called swap partitions. A swap partition is used in situations where you run out of memory. If you run out of memory or hard drive space, really bad things happen to Linux machines. You don't want to ever run out of memory, ever. It's bad. Don't do it. So a swap partition is nice because it takes a portion of the hard drive and it uses it as virtual memory. So when you start running out of hard drive space, well, not out of RAM, you will take pieces of your RAM that are not being used, you'll write them to the hard drive, and if you suddenly need those pieces of RAM again, you will pull it from the hard drive back into RAM and put something else on the hard drive. If you do that a whole lot, that's called thrashing. It's really bad for your system. It makes everything slow because the hard drive is much slower than RAM. So you want to have swap, but you don't want to have a large swap. And you don't want to ever have to use the swap. You just want it there in case you do run into it. So what are the other partition types? Well, you've got these Linux types. You've got your swap. You also have things like RAID partitions or LVM partitions. So LVM is the local or logical volume management. The idea being that you can create a giant partition and then make other fake-ish partitions inside of it. LVMs make it possible to resize and move data around seamlessly. So it's kind of nice to have LVM. But if you aren't making huge changes or adding hard drives, removing hard drives, or if you're using a virtual machine, there's really no need to have LVM. You can just stick with your standard Linux partitions. Once you have a partition, you need to install an, a file system into that partition. And there are different file systems. Linux came from the Minix world, and so you have this Minix file system. And then you have expansions, so it was uh, extended. The first uh, extension of Minix was ext2, and then you have ext3 and ext4, and these are extensions for the Minix file system. But there are other different um, file systems. You can have XFS, which is the default on a lot of newer Linux machines. You also have um, Windows partition types like FAT32 and you have your NTFS. And Linux can create different file systems and put them into partitions and use them. And the way it uses them is through mount points. A mount point is a directory in your directory structure. So you, you first have your first main partition, which is your root partition for the entire system. And then you'll have directories inside of that. And then you can take any one of those directories in there and say, oh, this directory is going to be redirecting to a different partition. And those redirections into a different partition where you merge two different partitions together into the same directory tree are called mount points. On Windows machines, you have your mount points as drive letters normally. So you have the C drive and the D drive and the E drive and the F drive, and those would all be separate partitions. Networking. Why should I set a host name? Well, your machine does much better if it has a host name. Everything seems to work better. Usually, it even works much better if the host name maps up to an actual DNS entry in a DNS server somewhere. But that isn't required. And if you have a host name on your machine, that doesn't mean that anybody else can see that host name. Maybe they have no idea what you've set. And you're not telling them what your host name is. So it's mostly for internal functioning and making sure you don't have to use the host name of localhost. Why should I turn on my networking? Well, you can't do software updates if you don't have networking. It's hard to do any networking-based things if you don't have networking. So really, you should turn it on. But when you turn it on, what should you use? Should you use DHCP or a manual configuration? Most computers out there on the internet use DHCP. Most servers actually use a manual configuration. So if you're using a client machine, you're going to use DHCP. 
in most cases. And you'll use a manual configuration for any time you need a server. There are some servers that will not run with DHCP. DNS servers really want manual configurations. Uh, DHCP servers want manual, manual configurations. Uh, Active Directory and things like that on Windows machines want manual configurations and don't really well run well on DHCP. Can I change the networking after installation? Of course. Linux networking on these uh, CentOS Linux-based machines tends to be managed by the NM or network management tools. And you can usually click on applets in your GUI to change your networking settings. Or you can use the NMTUI command from the command line to change your networking. <coughs> root. What is the root user? Well, the root user is the main root user that runs the entire system. Root is the process or the user that runs all kinds of stuff and makes everything work. So is it the same as administrative account? Well, not quite. Administrative users usually have uh, a group that they're part of. And on most Linux machines, it's the wheel group. So if you are a member of the wheel group, then you're considered a administrative user. And then the idea is that you can sometimes run administrative commands using different software things like the sudo command in order to run them as the root user. So what are the requirements for root password? Well, you really don't have a lot of requirements. Uh, with during installation, it might throw a fit if you are having simple, easy passwords, but you want to have a password that's hard to guess and that you can remember. So you need to remember the pass password and don't forget it. But why is it set during installation? Well, it's a lot harder to set it after you've installed, after you've booted up, when you're trying to log in. So make sure you set it during installation. Additional users. Why should I create additional users. Well, it is not usually good practice to run as the root user all the time. When you're doing administrative tasks, you want to be able to have root access, but you don't want to accidentally click on some link and do something accidentally and have your entire system destroyed because you're running as the root user. So you want to run as a different user. And in order to run as a different user, you need to create an additional user that is not the root user. You can make it an administrative account, which basically puts it in the wheel group and allows you to run the sudo command, sudo. And that allows you to run stuff as root. So you want to make sure you have a good username. And a good username is a username that is not one of these standard, easily guessed usernames. So standardly easy guess usernames would be your generic names you know, your Alice, Bob, and Eve, those kinds of things. You don't want to have bad passwords either. Make sure the password is good and does not match the username in any way. Make sure it's complex enough to be not guessed easily. Once you do your installation and you boot up, you have this initial setup thing. And the initial setup shows up during the GUI installation. They want you to accept the license agreement. And then um, if you don't set, accept the license, then they kind of really don't want you using it. So they try to force you to do the a license agreement. And then there's this whole thing about KDump. KDump basically is a feature that allows you to have all of your memory written out to the hard drive in cases of a kernel crash. Usually, you're not going to look at that, so you don't really care. But if you are a kernel developer, you might care about it and might want it there. Login options. What are the login options? Well, you can log in from your GUI, or you can log in from a command line. Normally, you start up in the GUI, and you just pass in your username and password 
and usually your, your user shows up. You can just click on your user and then type in the password. And that's how you get in. If you don't want to log in as one of the users that shows up, you can select additional users, type in the root user's name, which is root, all lowercase, and the root password to get into the GUI. Or you can press something like Control Alt and F2, or Control Alt F3, or Control Alt F4, or one of those numbers, and drop to a command line, and then log in as root with a password. When you log in, you want to make sure that you realize that when you're typing your password, it will not echo back any stars or letters or anything like that. So you just have to know that the password is being typed in. Just trust that something's going in there. It makes it so it's harder to do some kind of a screen observing and stealing. So that's what it's, that's for. So what might cause a login to fail? Well, you'll obviously fail to log in if you don't have that user on the system. You will fail if your password doesn't match the user's password. You will fail in some cases if you cannot log in because the hard drive is full or because directories got deleted. Um, you might also fail to log in if somehow permissions got set incorrectly, if the ownership of a directory got messed up, if you break things, if your SE Linux context got messed up. So if you break things, it might not work. So how do you know if they're working? Well, if you log in, it's working. So then what can you do in your system? Well, you can do updates. You can install software. You can run the software. Those are really the things you want to do. All right, so when you're booting up, what is the boot process? Well, you have a bootloader. A bootloader is a piece of software that is there to load your operating system. Why do you need that? Well, originally, when they started looking at operating systems, they decided to start with these really, really, really small processes. They decided that the first 512 bytes of memory would get loaded into memory, and then you just start running it. Well, that's great, but 512 bytes is not very much for anything. You can't really run a huge operating system that. But you can load a program that loads your bootloader that then loads your operating system. So it's a long process with multiple steps. You have your BIOS load your first bit of the hard drive. That first bit of the hard drive loads your bootloader. Your bootloader then loads your operating system. And then your operating system then starts up your initial process, which would be init or system D, the system D process would then load up your services and create, load up your GUI and create all of your terminal logins and all of that. So it's a, a long multiple step process. How do you set boot options? Well, it depends on which options you want to set. But normally when you're talking about boot options, you're looking at what the kernel loads as. And those can be configured in the grub configuration. And that's normally found in the ETC boot directory. And sometimes that gets written out there from other directories. And you can look around for grub configurations and just find things. Where are the boot files located? Well, normally in the boot directory. And the boot directory contains your kernel, your initial RAM disk, uh, mapping, your grub configurations, all those be stored in your boot directory. And I guess we already talked about how the system starts and when does the GUI start. But there we go. Navigation. So when you log in, where am I? Oh, where am I when I start? So normally you start right there in your home directory. And how do you move around? Well, in the GUI, you can click on things and look at different directories and they'll show you what's in them. If you get a terminal up, 
or if you log in from a terminal, you will start in your home directory and you can use the cd command to change directories. Then you figure out, well, where is everything stored? Well, programs and user files and logs and configuration files are all stored in different places. The programs are usually stored in the slash usr directory, but sometimes they're stored in the slash opt directory, and sometimes they're stored in the slash bin directory or slash sbin. It depends on which programs you want. User files are usually stored in the home directory, so slash home, and then your username. So you store all your files there. Logs get started in the slash var directory. So slash var slash log. You can go in there and take a look around and see what you find. And then configuration files are normally stored in the slash etc directory. So you can look at those and see what files can be edited and changed. When you're doing networking, it's kind of important to know what your IP address is. And you can type in ifconfig on most Linux and Unix-like systems. And that will tell you your IP address. So that's interface config, ifconfig. However, on newer Linux machines, you need to type in IP space ADDR. And that will tell you your IP address. It also tells you your MAC address. Your host name normally shows up in your prompt, but you can type in the keyword host name by itself to see what your host name is set to. Where is it set? It's normally set in the etc directory in a file called hostname. So slash etc slash hostname is where your hostname is normally set. Where is your DNS set? Well, there is the etc directory once again, because that's where the configuration files are at. There's an etc and then resolve.com resolve.conf is spelled without a trailing e on resolve so it's r-a-s-o-l-v dot c-o-n-f and it is your name server that's set there where is the ip address set well it is normally it depends on how how it's loaded but the configuration scripts for the ip address are in the etc uh, <coughs> etc directory and it's in the sysconfig network scripts directory and there is usually a file called ifcfg dash and then your interface name so ifcfg dash ens32 or ifcfg lo for the local loopback and so you just go in there and look at that um, how do you test your networking you can use ping traceroute um, you can try to do stuff how do you edit files? Well, you can view files with the cat command. The cat's actually from concatenate, but you can type in cat space and the name of a file and it will list the contents. You can look at them with the less command if you wanna scroll through it. Make sure you press Q if you wanna get out of less. Just less in the file name and Q to get out. But what about editing it? If you wanna edit it, you can use VI, Nano, Emacs, Gedit, any one of those editors. How do you get more editors? Well, you install them. You can use yum install in the name of the editor, assuming that's the name of the package that installs it. So which editors are best? Well, VI tends to be available on most systems. It's been around for a very long time, and many people who like archaic editors are familiar with VI. It is not the best editor. It is not a very good editor, and it's very cumbersome and complex, and people hate it. And because they hate it, they are starting to remove it. So it's starting to become less and less common on newer distributions, but it is pretty much installed on every Linux and Unix distribution out there right now. Nano. Nano is a much better one. Nano is based off of a original editor from the University of Washington called Pico. Um, the University of Washington had bad licensing, so Nano was created as a drop-in replacement for Pico, and that's kind of nice. It's a much easier um, editor to use, not incredibly powerful, but it is easy to use. Emacs is uh, one of the earlier editors as well, like VI. 
there was a long time a VI Emacs debate on which one was better. Emacs was written by the same people who wrote the GNU project. So um, comes from there. Emacs is very difficult to use and I recommend against using it. Fortunately, it is not installed on Linux distributions by default. So you don't have to worry. Gedit is your editor that shows up in your GUI. So much easier to use. You can click on buttons like a save button and open button and you can see everything. And so Gedit is kind of nice there. Software updates. How do I update the system? Well, use the yum command. So you can do a yum update yum, first of all, because you want to make sure your updater is updated all the way. If you don't have a fully updated updater, then weird things can happen sometimes. You want to make sure you update the software of the entire system. You can just do a yum update, and that will update everything. Um, if new programs are available, it will update anything that's new. Um, you can also update new stuff with uh, by just doing yum install any in individual package and again update or install new packages. How do I know if it's already installed? Well, you can try yum install something and, and if it says it's already installed, then it's installed. You can also type in the RPM command and look at the RPM database directly. So you can do RPM minus QA to list all of your packages or just RPM minus Q and the name of the package and see if it's installed. How do you uninstall it? Well, you can do yum remove and the package. Um, you can also do the RPM package directly. RPM minus E for erase and then the package name. So what happens when you update GUI files while in the GUI? Well, that happens sometimes. If you do a full system update and you're in the GUI, sometimes the GUI gets updated. And as you might imagine, if you're in the middle of running a program and that program changes, sometimes you have to read parts of that program from memory, and sometimes you have to read parts of that program from the hard drive. And if it changes, it changes on the hard drive, and you can get an inconsistent state that crashes. So don't update your GUI from in the GUI. Drop down to the command line and do it from there. How do I connect to the internet? Well, with the network. But you also need to have your browsers. So Firefox and other browsers are great. If you want, you can even install Chrome or other browsers. They are available and can be installed. How do I get a remote terminal? Well, remote terminals are things like SSH. So you can use SSH, and it's already installed on your system by default. So you can type SSH space and the IP address of a machine to log into that machine. Um, sometimes you need to pass a username. I usually do SSH space username at symbol IP address to log into machines. How do I get a remote GUI? Well, that's a lot more complex. Um, you can have your X11 GUI exported and then you just go from one Linux machine to another Linux machine and you can start up things like terminals inside the or web browsers inside of your local machine that are actually running on the remote machine. Or you can use something like um, VNC or other software to get a remote GUI. Capturing data. How do I take a screen print? <clears throat> well, if you're running a virtual machine, that gets a little bit tricky. Sometimes the screen print button works for taking pictures, and sometimes the screen print button doesn't. Um, if you want to take a screen print of something, uh, and you want to show what's going wrong when you're trying to talk to people, it's usually best if you're outside of in a virtual machine to take a picture of the virtual machines window using your local screen printing tools such as um, the snipping tool on Windows. How do you get data from a terminal? Well, it depends on how you're connected. If you're connected to your virtual machine 
through your virtual machine's window. Maybe you can't. Um, maybe you can. Maybe you just select it and copy it. Sometimes it copies out. Sometimes it doesn't. What's usually easiest is if you SSH into your virtual machine or SSH into your machine, it's easy to copy and paste into an SSH um, terminal emulator. And that makes it much easier. In addition to that, if you have a terminal emulator that allows you to do file copying, you can just usually drag and drop or copy it. <clears throat> Sometimes you use the SCP command to do a secure copy between machines as well. And then last, how do I get out of my GUI? <clears throat> usually there is a button in the upper right-hand corner. Sometimes it's the lower right-hand corner. Sometimes it's the upper left-hand corner. And sometimes it's the lower left-hand corner. So you just have to figure out where it is. But click on the button and it will allow you to log out or shut down the machine. How do I log out of a textbook terminal? Just type the exit command until you are logged out. How do I shut down? Well, in the GUI, you just find the button to shut down. On the command line, you type in the shutdown command to shut down. Usually you have to tell it when you want to shut down. So type in shut down and then the keyword now to shut down now. How do you reboot? Just type reboot on the command line or from the GUI, find out where your button is. And this has been a quick little overview of your Linux installation and leaving Linux machine, using a Linux machine. So good luck.